into our next session. So the first thing is just a tiny bit of housekeeping, which is we have great teams who all come up and they will all present for three minutes each and uh, they will share their screen and then we will have our panel of experts, maybe judges, I'm not sure what to call them, but experts for sure, uh, ask questions for about nine minutes. If there's burning questions from the audience, you can put them in the chat and I will try to get to them. Otherwise, I will turn it over to panelists. And panelists, what I will say is, if you could give the quick introduction of who you are, what you like to invest in, um, we'll kick it off that way. So who wants to go up first? Let me change my view so I can see. Blake, maybe I will call on you because I see you on my screen. Um, would you like to introduce yourself and say where you're from? Sure, happy to. Uh, so I'm Blake Stevens. I'm with Alexandria Venture Investments, which is the strategic venture arm of Alexandria Real Estate Equities. Uh, Alexandria Real Estate Equities is the largest provider of commercial life science and ag tech space, laboratory space in the country. And uh, as our strategic venture arm, we invest in the sectors of our tenants, meaning we invest in the life science and ag tech sectors. I'm based in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, and I'm in charge of all of our investment activity for the Southeast, as well as all of our ag tech and food tech investment activity. So we go across all stages from very, very early uh, to late, and uh, you know, always looking for great companies and great teams to fund. Fantastic, glad to have you here. Nice to cross paths. All right, uh, Robert, would you like to go next? I see we've got sure. a team from Good Growth. Yeah, I'm Robert Poor. I'm advisor to Good Growth Capital. Um, years ago, I started a company called Ember that was making Zigbee chips for the internet of things. So I care a lot about connectivity. Um, I'm a technologist at heart. I graduated from the MIT Media Lab. And the same people that helped me launch my company later started Good Growth Capital and asked me to be an advisor. Um, so I continue to focus on internet of things, but uh, my real passion today, nowadays, is all about energy and the future of energy and how we pivot to a non-carbon-based economy. Great. Uh, Z, why don't I pair you with Robert? Sure. Sounds good. Yeah, Robert and I know each other from way back uh, at MIT, and um, so I'm also a technologist turned technology entrepreneur and a venture partner with Good Growth, and we invest in early stage complex science and technology startups, um, anywhere from pre-seed to series A. Fantastic, glad to have you here. Uh, Sylvia. Hi everyone, great to be here. I hope you don't mind that I'm kind of multitasking with mommy duties. So occasionally there may be some screens in the background that I'm watching the kids. Um, but yes, yeah, so hi, my, my name is Sylvia. I'm a venture partner with Sarah Cap Ventures. Um, Sarah Cap Ventures is an early stage global uh, firm, which focuses mainly on cybersecurity, early uh, enterprise AI, and also health tech. Um, I joined the firm uh, last year. My background is in international human rights and after uh, two decades of working on social justice and international human rights policy, I joined Sarah Cap to actually launch um, their impact fund, which is called Sarah Cap Cares. Uh, so on the Sarah Cap Care side, we're a woman-led impact fund, and we invest in what we call the three E's, environment, education, and the empowerment, particularly of underserved communities. Um, they're a brand new fund and always excited to learn more of what's happening in, in this area. Great. Okay. Tapasia. Hi. Hi, I'm Tapasya Bali. Um, I'm with East West Bank. Uh, we primarily do uh, venture debt financing, uh, primarily for early stage and mid stage companies and emerging technologies. Um, I also recently joined the bank uh, in December of last year. Uh, before that, I had my own venture um, in the consumer space that I scaled up to 75 million in valuation. Uh, happy to be here, excited to hear from all the companies today. Excellent. What a what a group we have. This should be a lot of fun. I'm going to not waste any time and bring in, don't tell me, don't tell me, Catapower. Glad to have you all here. Thanks, Minnie. Thanks for having us. Great. Let's Take it see. Away. My name is Travis Williams, and I'm a founder of Catapower. 
We are a uh, clean tech renewable chemicals company that has a proprietary catalyst and process to convert glycerol, which falls out of biodiesel production into lactate salts, which are very rapidly emerging in the food preservation, animal feed and personal care industries as antimicrobials that displace chlorine, bleach and ammonia from our food and water supplies. We've only got one earth and to protect it, here in the United States, we're brewing up 1.7 billion gallons of biodiesel fuel to reach toward a carbon neutral fuel supply every year. The problem is biodiesel is more expensive than petroleum diesel and the government has to subsidize it so that the industry can even break even. By taking the 10% byproduct glycerol that comes out of biodiesel and upgrading it in value to lactate, we can simultaneously serve underserved markets while balancing the economics of biodiesel production. Is that about right, Josh? That's about right. So uh, let me give you an introduction to the company. The Caterpillar team has the skills and the knowledge necessary to bring that vision into a commercial reality. We have backgrounds in academia and the chemical in process industry and in business development. Our core technology is patent protected here in the US and we've conducted detailed experimental and modeling efforts to ensure the viability of our process. Currently we're working to establish key partnerships with industry leaders. Let's take a look at our timeline here. Previously, we've developed this process at USC and scaled it to the one kilogram scale. We've also brought on board our senior advisor, Mike Giardello. Earlier this year, we uh, leveraged our seed financing to move into independent lab space in Pasadena, where our current efforts are focused on scaling up to 10 kilogram scale. That's going to allow us to start sending qualification customers to uh, qualification samples to potential customers under our existing MTA. Beyond that, we're going to continue to scale tenfold, and we anticipate we'll have our first commercial supply agreement in place next year which will give some investors uh, additional confidence as we move into our next financing round. Beyond that, we are continuing to work towards scaling up towards manufacturing scale deployment uh, and expanding our catalytic platform. We've received some non-dilutive funding, funding from a variety of sources, uh, including from EPA SBIR program. We're also pursuing complementary funding through the NSF SBIR program. In addition, we have some investments through Mount Wilson Ventures and their limited partners. And we'd love to connect with any of the attendees here. Our email addresses are here on the slide. And you can also contact us directly through the Hoover portal. So we're excited to answer any questions that you all might have. Fantastic, um, I'll bring the, the judge panel back. Great, um, I'm, I'm loving it. I do like it very much. Two quick questions. Um, what is the end-to-end -end time from going from the raw materials to the finished product, just going through the process? I can answer that. So process time uh, is max about two days. That's something that we have a path to further decreasing. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's our max currently. We think there's a, a very reasonable technical trajectory to cut that down further. I mean, with pipelining, I don't see, you know, I don't see that as a long-term problem. Where it becomes interesting is when you're actually trying to scale up and mm -hmm. the amount of inventory you have to take on before it comes out the other end. So that's, that's, that's why I'm asking the question. Um, and the other thing is that um, uh, Travis mentioned making biodiesel economical, but I'm not sure how that fits into your particular business model. Do you plan to subsidize biofuels? It's, it's a happy byproduct of the fact that we can create a lot of value from something that that industry is throwing away. Right, but who gets to reap that value? Do you do it or does the industry do it? Uh, we, we think the taxpayers we, we think reap some a... of it as the EPA lowers the RIN credit uh, that's subsidizing biodiesel okay. and yeah. uh, we will reap some of it uh, as we uh, proliferate the use of this fine chemical. That makes sense. Thank you. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about um, 
what the competition is like. There are other ways of producing um, lactic acid. And um, so what is the catalyst and what, what are the objections of the existing uh, processes? Um, is it yield? Is it, you know, if you could help uh, the you energy bet. required, et cetera. You um, bet. First I'm of all, you're absolutely right. Uh, there are two really good paths to uh, lactic acid and lactate salts. The first is fermentation. This makes a, uh, a chiral and enantiomerically pure uh, lactic acid product that is suitable for polylactic acid. We make a racemic product that's not suitable for that application, which is a relatively minor component of the industry. It's expensive to convert fermentation lactic acid into lactate salts because of the cost of the, the base and the salt. Uh, and the fermentation reactors that we have in the US cannot keep up with demand. Mm. We have a chemical pathway that uh, we can heat it, take a chemical catalyst, heat it to a higher temperature, uh, very high throughput. We can make a lot of the racemic stuff because our catalyst is chemical and not a micro. Uh, this enables us to fill the uh, food supply preservation needs of where there's can't. There are many other chemical catalysts in the space. Uh, the, our unique insight is we designed a homogeneous catalyst that masters the problem of producing the compound selectively. All of the competing pathways, uh, and there's a really good one that came out of Yale a little ways before we did, have at the very best 95% purity, where the impurity is a glycol, like ethylene glycol, which is toxic and can't be used in food supply because we engineered this catalyst to avoid the disqualifying impurity that other methods have, we have a unique ability to serve the unserved market that is most rapidly growing, which is uh, uh, food and environmental applications. And if Are I can you? just really briefly add something to that. Uh, if we're comparing our process to the fermentation-based stuff that Travis mentioned, we're, we're not looking at modest improvements. We're looking at significant improvements. What comes out of the back end of a fermentation reactor is about 2% by weight lactic acid or lactate salts and 98% by weight other stuff that needs to be removed through energy intensive and labor intensive purifications. In contrast to our process, what comes out of our, our reaction is 95% uh, or more lactate salts. So we're, we're looking at orders of magnitude improvement just in, just in terms of downstream purification alone. Just a follow-up question. Um, how do you think of this category in general? Um, you know, I know there's other preservatives like organic preservatives like rosemary, for example. Do you think there will be more demand for things like that and making this obsolete? What is your thought on that? I think the cost of this material is very low compared to other uh, you know, pheromone approaches, natural product approaches, biologic approaches. It's also very stable material. It's easy to ship. Uh, it is accepted widely uh, in the industry as an antimicrobial, uh, although it's produced from these very energy demanding separations of the fermentation broth uh, to get because they have to brutalize it so much to get it separated, they, they make relatively low quality lactate. Uh, and we, can, we can make a superior product uh, in much, much faster time and larger scale. Uh, we anticipate that when we make the racemic lactate salts widely available, they will rapidly displace many antimicrobials in meat production. We think they will also, particularly the potassium salts, uh, find applications as soil amendments. They're being used for environmental re remediation of things like hexavalent chromium, although that's a several million uh, a small uh, segment of the industry. And we anticipate that with the availability of these on large scale, uh, additional applications will be found. Actually, on that note, I'm just curious about um, your go-to-market strategy, because it seemed like initially, again, the um, the focus on kind of converting the glycerol, but it just so happened that there was also this additional opportunity with lactates and you know, the fact that that industry is so behind. Um, so is the strategy then to kind of target the lactate market first or you know, what's, what's your strategy there? It's all about the product. It's all about filling an unfilled need in the lactate market. 
uh, we can't make it fast enough. Uh, and as we talk with, there's two major suppliers in the United States, Hawkins is a domestic supplier and Galactic, which is a European supplier. As we talk to Hawkins, they cannot fill orders for the racemic lactate as, as quickly as demands are coming in and they are very eager to sell on our behalf. Our go to market strategy initially is to let them do it uh, and let them use their uh, sales and distribution network uh, to sell our product as we scale and then uh, make a determination either to exit or to develop our own sales and distribution network. What are the CapEx requirements for scaling up to exit and what, what is your exit strategy? Uh, Mike, would you like to address that? Mike is our acting CEO. He's on the call. Hi, Mike. Uh, Mike, you're muted. muted there. there you go. How you doing? Hi, Z. It's been a while. Um, there's, it's not unusual CapEx. Uh, the nice thing about this technology, I'd say the most, uh, one of the most attractive things is it's uh, run as a neat, quote unquote, neat reaction. Uh, we don't have to worry about organic solvents, um, the glycerol. Uh, we use, you know, uh, one industrial component, some, some caustic uh, soda, or if you need to use the potassium salt. So it's basically add, add to reactor, uh, heat, add catalyst. Um, we didn't really mention it here, but the byproduct uh, of, the, of the reaction is uh, we produce an equal amount of hydrogen, which is uh, very beneficial for initially at the small scale. We just use it to help generate the heat for the reaction, uh, but could be an interesting uh, byproduct in the end if we integrate with either a biodiesel facility or a glycerin aggregator purifier. So there's opportunities for both um, upstream and downstream integration. So there could be a possibility of being acquired by a glycerol aggregator as another way to add value. So they buy, there's a lot of times when glycerol, like for instance, in Europe, glycerol was a negative value uh, because they, there's no real use for it. So the idea of taking a glycerol added uh, aggregator and allow them to create additional value by converting some of that glycerol to, to lactate salts or even integrating with the biodiesel facility uh, because they make the glycerol, low, low quality glycerol, they could then augment their, um, their business by upgrading some of the glycerol to, to lactate salts. So there's opportunities for uh, acquisition by either of those types of companies or from a lactate producer themselves, or ones that you know, either Hawkins being the largest US, they could be interested in potentially either licensing or acquiring to uh, be able to offer their own supply in addition to what they purchased off the market. Really and, what's, and what's the feedback been uh, from groups like that when they encounter you guys and your technology? Uh, well, they were I, pretty, I was going to say pretty positive. They were pretty quick to put an MTA in place. And for them, it's, um, you know, get samples out, uh, get qualified and start sampling customers. Um, they've also been very helpful at looking at new. So they understand the existing market very, very well. But for them, the growth opportunities are in things like soil augmentation, remediation. So in fertilizer, you know, it's all about NKP, you know, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus. And so potassium lactate is a great way to deliver potassium um, easily to soil, but also now you have a carbon source. So you're feeding the, the microbes in the soil, not only the carbon source, but now a potassium source. Um, and then also, as, as Travis mentioned, remediation um, using uh, lactate salts as chelators for heavy metals. Uh, there's considerable emerging applications in sort of benign ways of uh, soil remediation. So I think uh, outside of the sort of the existing markets, they're also very interested in, in working with us and developing uh, new applications in new, in new market segments. And on the hydrogen product, we've had, uh, we've had interactions with biodiesel producers, for example, World Energy and Paramount, who said, you know, we would have to rail in the glycerol to run this here and we don't so much care about the profit we would make from the lactate, being able to generate hydrogen at scale here in Southern California has huge value because the cost of transporting that fine chemical is prohibitive uh, in California law. So even though they would have had it brought in the glycerol and then would have had to export the product, uh, they wanted the hydrogen uh, right there in their Paramount refinery. Well, team, this seems like it has amazing potential and appreciate you all. I think the conversation will have to continue uh, offline, but really appreciate you guys coming in today and what you're building. And without further ado, I'm gonna-, I'm gonna thank, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. A pleasure. Great. I'm gonna uh, invite current RF onto the stage. <clears throat> Great, good to meet you. Let me see if I can share my screen. Hang on a second. And got everything else here.
Can, 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 you, sh can you see my screen? Or not? Got... Okay, hang on a minute. Gonna see if the tech folks can help. And if you get stuck, we'll give you another minute to figure it out. Don't okay. worry. About it. I think okay. we can probably bring up the next group if needed. Yeah, go ahead and do that. I'll see if I can get this working. So. You sure. Okay. I'll give it a second. Okay. Let's see. Let me see if liquidate happens. I think I see Mark Cortez up there. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, well, I see Michael. Yeah. Okay. Oh. All right. Thank, <laughs> thank you out there. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. But let's go back to Michael. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh boy. Sometimes these things. Hang on a second. That's what we had to do to make it work. <laughs> now, if I can just simply. Okay. Hold on a moment. Okay. There we go. Okay. Can you see the complete screen now? We gotcha. Got yes. Okay. Good enough. Thank you. That's the hard part. Okay. Anyway, basically, my name is Michael Hopkins. I'm the founder and CEO of Current RF. What we do is we, we're expanding the EV driving range via essentially getting uh, recycling noise in the system. In other words, if you take a trip from San Clemente to Tucson, Arizona, in a typical electric vehicle today, you won't make it unless you have to go to a charging station. So anyway, we can get 450 miles on a Tesla, for instance. Uh, without us plugged in, you only get to Phoenix and maybe a little bit beyond it. So essentially, we, what we're doing is we're literally recycling the noise that's in the system and essentially uh, 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 we can get 10% more driving range out of electric vehicles. And the way we do this is, like I said, we recycle the noise and reduce the battery current uh, that's flowing from the battery. And we do this in two, and we can do this in two places. One is outside the electric vehicle via effectively a charging port cap, if you will, if, we, if you engage the, the contactors in, in the electric vehicle itself or if we can basically get inside the electric vehicle, it's a very simple modification to a DC link cap. And this is the DC link cap. It's, it looks like a big battery, if you will. Our ICs basically are just hugged the ground side of that, of that uh, uh, DC link cap, and it's a very simple modification. As I mentioned before, we can actually do this external in the, D, in the uh, charging port caps, say in a Tesla, for instance, basically. And so, so the bottom line is we can do it either place. Um, anyway, long and short, we have three business models here. One is, of course, I've already mentioned two of them, basically the DC link cap inside the electric vehicle, the charging port caps. Uh, we also do intellectual property in the chips that go in these vehicles. We can even put this in the BMS, the battery management system, if you will. It really goes any place. It's very robust from what we've seen. This is the management team, myself, my wife, my son, my daughter, that's the core team of, of current RF, if you will. We have two PhD advisors, one at NC State and one basically in the industry that's involved with electric vehicles. And of course, we have a media specialist, uh, Savannah, Savannah Hopkins, which is my son's uh, wife, of course. <laughs> so anyway, long and short of it is, our current, the, our current traction, basically, we, we can build this for $10 per EV. Uh, we're projecting if we got into every EV today, $70 million in profit and by 2030, 1.4 billion. And of course, electric vehicles are coming online and you see these in LinkedIn all the time at this point. Uh, we are basically talking to Tesla, Ford, uh, uh, various companies at this point on this essentially. And, and, and of course, in intellectual property and, and ICs, of, of course, basically with uh, various companies at the bottom there, effectively. And what we're li really looking for is a million dollars in investment. Uh, we, the biggest problem we have is no one knows about this. Uh, we need sales money to go out and really sell this the way we want to, get it pr produced. Uh, we can produce it. Uh, we've got a little bit of mechanical engineering left to do, but that's minor as far as that, as far as the CC, uh, CCS caps are concerned. Long and short, it is we, uh, we we're again we're looking for advertising money to go out and advertise this into the marketplace proper, uh, as far as that goes. So anyway, thank you very much, and uh, we would appreciate your investment, obviously, as far as that goes. Thank you very much. Michael, super interesting. Mm -hmm. 
I have a very simple question. You mentioned ten dollars per EV. Is Correct. that price or cost? First off, that would be price. We can okay. produce these ICs for fifty cents or less. So, and would that single IC, would that single ten dollar part get you the ten percent increase in range, yes. or do you need multiple devices per car? Well, basically, you need multiple devices, but essentially, we we found that in testing, basically five devices in parallel take care of. Uh, really gets get you the extra 10%. We started off with e-bikes on this a few months ago, basically, then went to electric vehicles after that. The technology scales. For instance, if we've got a heavy haul electric vehicle that we like a semi truck, for instance, it may be seven devices. Long and short, we just have to have enough to really make sure the metal migration doesn't happen inside the IC, that type of Right. Thing. So There's under 100 bucks gets you 10% yes. increase in, in mileage. Definitely, definitely. And quite frankly, we try to make this as economical as possible. We're very, we're completely green here. The long and the short of it is what happens is, uh, you know, most electric vehicles today, there's, there has to be electric generation someplace. And usually the carbon footprint is basically coal. But this com completely green, we don't need that extra energy to really do the same job because we're harvesting the noise. If you've ta ever taken a look, cross-sectional look at a cable in a Tesla, for instance, it's a coax cable. There's a reason for that. There's a ton of RF energy inside that vehicle. If they didn't shield it, you'd hear it from a radio frequency perspective miles away. So we're harvesting that noise. That's what we're doing. Cool. So, thank you. Thank you. This is fascinating. Um, can you just to clarify? So this would be you'd be partnering with the manufacturers. You, you couldn't sell this aftermarket, right? We we could do it either way. I mean, we yeah. partner with we prefer to partner with manufacturers because we can produce EICs, essentially sell them to them. They can integrate them. That's the best possible path. But how protectable is this, and what's the barrier to entry? Barrier to entry is not invented here, Senator. I mean, you really run into oh, that. Oh, sorry. Let, to clarify, what's the barrier to entry for com competitors to do the same thing as you? Uh, the IP itself. We are very. Uh, it's patent. It's patented technology, and it and and we sort of do the lock and key philosophy. In other words, say somebody basically steals the the intellectual property from the chip. There's certain things that we do externally to the chip that nobody knows about. So ultimately, I call it the lock and key philosophy. The bottom line is they may get the lock, but they don't have the key. And that's the real barrier to entry for competitors because they can't reproduce this. We can. It's, it's an IC we produced about four years ago, and uh, it's very unusual. I'm an IC design engineer. I designed it as far as that goes. Very unusual, very strange convergence of IC technology. Uh, and it's common. It doesn't have, there, there's no uh, process development that has to happen. So the bottom line is it's, uh, it's all, it's very unusual. We're combining things in the RF domain that usually don't, uh, nobody even thinks about combining to, to do this. So you say that the patent is issued. So um, how would I find it? Uh, I can, I think it's in the slides. Okay. It's on the slides. You send the slides. I think it's 10666098, if I remember correctly. Okay. <laughs> so, or 89, one of the two. I can't remember. Okay. So, so um, and, and I think you, you partially answered this, but I, I think in, in situations like this where uh, a simple solution creating, you know, a real step function and improvement, um, you know, as an investor, there's always just a, like a hint of like, hmm, like, like, why, why this, why now? And, you know, you said you've, you've combined some of these in a, you know, in a different way using your background, but maybe could you just go a little bit more on like the innovation that you came upon to really get this 10% improvement, which is, a, as you mentioned in your slides, you know, dramatic improvement of battery life with uh, a relatively low cost part and like a kind of a bolt on solution. Right. Uh, you know, I just kind of curious that path that took you. Uh, yeah, I, this started about four or five years ago, basically, uh, just thinking about how could I, how could I basically harvest dynamic power in ICs, microprocessors? Because anytime you have a switching event, 
you have an, a little bit of overlap current that's drawn to change logic states. But the same thing on a larger scale is happening in the electric vehicles. And essentially, that that's we started off with that, and we made some money with that effectively. But uh, the real breakthrough was like, okay, we can get two amps of current reduction here from the batteries with this technology. Uh, I wasn't sure if that could happen uh, before we really tested it in the lab, and all of a sudden, boom, there it is. So the, the, the real motivation here was to say, say, how can I reduce dynamic power in systems? And uh, this thing hugs the supply line generally. Uh, and th that was it, one step. We started off with a lab experiment that went very right. Uh, we put it on a PC board, found components we could do it with. That went very right. Then found a way to reduce it to an IC four or five years ago. And that went very right. Uh, this whole thing has really been just, and quite frankly, it works better than the simulations say it would, simply because the modeling isn't really up to snuff. So th that's been sort of the pathway on this. And it's, uh, it, it's you know, quite frankly, it's been a series of good surprises, <laughs> if you know what I'm saying. You Sometimes in the IC industry, you get surprised in a very bad way. You know, something doesn't work. In this case, it worked better than we ever expected it to. And now it's just a matter of finding the right application. And it looks like electric vehicles is that we can actually use this same technology to increase. I didn't put this in the slides, but to really decrease the, you know, the uh, charging time at, at the fast charging stations, because we're basically recovering that power and throwing it into the battery itself. And uh, there's a, we can do solar, wind energy, uh, conversion efficiency increases with this. It's a really can be a ubiquitous solution across the industry. Our biggest problem is we're kind of working our way out of a little pinhole into the world, and we just need to expand that. That's really what it comes down to. So I hope we're I've answered your question. We're running out of time. Does anyone else have another question they want to get in? Top, top yeah. Top. I was thinking, what is your strategy for exit? You know, are you considering maybe selling the patents for to Tesla or uh, you want to scale this company up? Any of the above. I mean, we're really open to various business models on this intellectual property and chips. I mean, basically we can, our exit could be partnering with, with a Tesla or somebody and they buy it outright. Uh, that's not a problem for us as far as that goes, or we, or we can just produce this and go across multiple manufacturers. Uh, it's relatively easy to produce. So anyway. All right. Well, once again, we may have to do some follow-up if there's more questions from the panel or from the audience. By all uh, means. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you. And thank you for your patience with my ineptness in Zoom. <laughs> thank you very we much. all have never experienced those issues before. <laughs> um, let's Thank bring you. in Mark from Liquid Aid, who I know is still here. I'm here. Fantastic, Mark. Thanks for coming up. Take it away. Let me uh, share my slides here. Okay, hopefully uh, everyone can see that. Looks good. Very good. Thank you. Well, uh, Thank you for, uh, for letting me present here. I'm uh, uh, Mark Cortez. I'm the CEO and founder of Liquidate. We are producing a revolutionary software platform that allows companies to go water neutral. Um, let me start with the market, okay? And um, water sustainability has become a foundation of corporate brand value, okay? Every, every company that I'm showing here, every uh, our, our large global international companies, they all have public water management goals, okay? So bottom line is it's good business to manage your water in a very public way. Okay? It helps your brand value, it helps your PR value. Um, so all of these companies, very prominent companies, they have water sustainability goals. Um, Coca-Cola is a great example. Their goal is very aggressive. 100% water neutral across their entire enterprise. Um, and the, the verbiage appears very prominently in their corporate documents, their annual reports, right? For every drop of water that we use, we give one back. Okay, very aggressive, uh, very upfront with how they want to manage their water. And here's the challenge that they have. They hand that over to their corporate sustainability team. 
and they say, all right, corporate sustainability directors, go do this, right? And so here are their choices. They can restore watersheds. They can uh, find new sources of water. They can systematically upgrade their infrastructure with low flow valves and devices and things like that. Um, or they can go uh, and then they still can't ever get down into their supply chain. And so the quote I'm showing here is from a, a corporate sustainability director, which is, I can't zero out our water footprint. Corporate goals, really difficult to implement. Um, and that's where we come in. Okay, Water conservation offsets are a way to go water neutral in instantly. How do they work? You have other companies save water for you. The way that we baseline it, the way that we account for it, the way that we put it into our database and offer it up for sale, uh, that's all part of our intellectual property. And then companies like Coca-Cola could go in there and buy these offsets to match their water sustainability goals. Uh, competitively, uh, this is how we stack up. You'll see if you wanna go water neutral today, this is how you do it. You can, you can go and, and com completely neutralize your water footprint today with carbon offsets. You can, you can extend that down into your supply chain um, and you can also do this across your entire enterprise. Hey, I'm Mark Cortez. I've spent 20 years in the renewable energy markets. So a lot of this probably looks familiar with carbon markets um, where I've spent a lot of time um, so I'm the CEO and founder of this. Dave Simmons is my technical, um, my CTO and has a tremendous amount of, of software development experience. I've got great advisors. Lincoln Blevins is the director of sustainability at Stanford. Leila Kasuri is a global policy water analyst. And I know I'm running short of time here. So um, here's what I'm looking for. Um, we uh, expect $83 million of, of year five revenue High margin, so I can discuss more about that. Uh, we will be fundraising one to 1.2 over the next 18 months. Um, and we have uh, a pretty, I think, uh, sound exit strategy. And so I will leave it with that. I know I ran out of time here, but that's, uh, that's what Liquidate is doing. Question um, on the validation. Uh, yes. You see this in the carbon markets, right? And ag is has a lot of potential. Uh, yes. and in this concern of how do you actually validate a carbon credit? How how are you going to approach that with water? Yeah. Um, well, so we have purposely stayed away from our from the ag market at least initially, even though we know it has tons of potential. Um, it's a it's a, it's a bit of a different um, different animal. So um, we we get the uh, Right now it's enabled by data acquisition systems. So we tap into APIs of data monitoring systems. So uh, we've got some that we can pull up from residential. We've got some from large industrial systems. So we get that data immediately. Uh, and then we, we have a process that we baseline it and then we can track performance against that baseline. Uh, and again, the way that we capture that is, is part of our IP. But the way that we're going to validate that is we're gonna use a third party agency to essentially audit the way that we uh, count count the savings, to validate that it meets our own standards, um, and essentially give it a seal of approval that yes, it does um, actually uh, constitute water additionality, which is the big the big word right in in water conservation. Did that answer your question? Um, just on that, um, that uh, when we talk to corporate clients, that's the question, right? How do you prove it? Right, because carbon um, carbon markets have been uh, fraudulent in many ways. That there's a lot of fraud that goes on. You can double and triple sell uh, carbon sequestration credits. Uh, we have a way. The way that we do that is we use past data. We, we get data and we can actually show historically with real data um, and transparently. We will show you the water that was saved. We can show you where. We can show you all of the data that that goes into doing that. So. Um, that's part of the way that we do that. And then by using an, ex an external agency um, that will give it a stamp that, uh, that validates that, that uh, we believe will, will help give us the validation that, uh, that is needed at the corporate level. You mentioned that you have a lot of experience um, from carbon markets, and I'm curious about what you've learned in the process. How are you approaching this differently than had you been, <laughs> had you been not so yeah, uh, you know, um, educated? 
Yeah. So, you know, you go into this, I, I went into this, uh, I mean, this came from the carbon market, right? I kept thinking for years, I was thinking, why can't we do this in water conservation? When we wanted people to go to solar, we paid them, right? It wasn't rocket science, right? <laughs> we, we worked to give incentives. We paid people to switch their energy sources. Why can't we do that, right? So that, that was how this started. So similarities between energy and water, yes, um, but then fundamental differences. Um, uh, one of the big differences I know that we found out early on with water is the first question that anybody in water asks is who owns the water rights? Okay, so it's sort of, a, I'm going to call it 1800, you know, uh, year 1800 way of thinking, right? It's um, so who owns the water rights is, is the big one. And I think we have to, that's part of the things that we have to um, um, help people understand is this is not about water rights. This is literally the the virtual value of water credits. When companies today say that they're going zero carbon, okay, and um, it's climate math, and I could spend hours talking about climate math, right? But there's a way that you do it. It's accounting, so you can save it here and you take credit for it here. It's exactly what's happening in the carbon market. So I think a lot of those concepts apply, um, but there are some, some nuances um, that, that come along with water. Uh, did, did that answer your question? Um, <laughs> enough for now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Is there anyone else who's doing this in this space? Are you the only one? There are a couple other people doing it. Um, I know some other, there's a, another company that's doing it and they are essentially a utility service company. So they are essentially the utility, the local utility that they've contracted with is telling them what constitutes water savings, okay? We've, I've, we've purposely gone away from that. Maybe it's from spending years working with uh, huge electric utilities, IOUs here in California. Um, they will of course be a larger market once we get this done. But I think the bigger potential for this is the true d democratization, uh, that's a hard word to say, of uh, the value of water credits, okay? And so if, if Coca-Cola wants to subsidize other people to save water for them, which is essentially what they're doing, they should be able to do that. And they should be able to, to take claim for actually saving these and be able to publicly proclaim that. Um, and so, um, so we have steered away from having the, the utilities be in the middle of that. Eventually we will, we will get them on board with this, um, but we wanna be able to do, be the one to set the standard and to create this essentially a new type of, uh, of water commodity. So the question is on the supply, sorry. So yeah. on the supply side, how do you anticipate getting that supply? You know, obviously the demand, you have all these corporations, but um, how would you get the supply for the credits? Yeah, so initially we're, we're, we've been talking with uh, corporations who are managing their water supply. So that a lot of times it's the same people who are, um, they're undertaking water um, saving measures um, either through equipment and operations adjustments or behavioral changes. Okay, on the residential side, we can put in all kinds of programs and incentive programs to help homeowners save water, but we need lots of homes to make up the volume of water that we need to sell to large corporate clients. So, um, so we, we, can, uh, we will be working with um, industrial water sales companies who have industrial water sales equipment. We help their ROI when they present things to customers because they say, not only do you save water, through your water bill by installing this equipment, but we can also give you additional money back by selling the credits for this water that you have saved. So what, could you explain the kind of the economics a little bit more? Is this purely an, uh, an ESG play for the companies or do you anticipate regulatory changes that are going to be driving some of that behavior? Um, explain a little bit more about what that um, what the drive it, driver is for this. Yeah, it's um, it's not yet at the regulatory or the compliance market. This is the voluntary market, right? So um, so it's 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 an ESG play, but look when these when when a, any company, when any corporation stands up and says, I'm going to be zero whatever, right? Zero carbons, zero energy, zero water, uh, it's always a public play. Right, they're all they're managing. They're it's licensed to operate. They are increasing their brand value by being sustainable, and that's what they do. And so this is a play on that. And and it, but it's it's a it, there's real value here. I think when uh, um, when corporations do this, they're looking for ways to 
well, increase their brand value. Okay, I think longer term, I think as the compliance markets, like here in California, we've got sort of a pseudo market where they've mandated certain things, but if you don't meet them, then you know a little slap on the hand and and you know we go about our business. So longer term, I think as the compliance markets get some teeth into it, this this dovetails in with that nicely because we've got the mechanism that's set up to do that. Forgive my uh, naivete in this, but have there been, I'm sure there've been a million studies on carbon markets of kind of, and I wonder if in the water market, it would be the same, uh, the kind of studies that show that this actually induces conservation behavior, or if it's just um, moving the credits around and people yeah. are doing this anyway. Yeah, um, so here's the difference. And, and this is this gets into the philosophy of, of carbon credits, right? It's carbon credits, you're trading for something that may or may not happen in the future, okay? Water, my credits are things that have already happened and I can prove it, okay? And so that's the difference. And I think fundamentally, I can show, if Coca-Cola buys a million gallons of water from me, I can show that a million gallons of water was saved. You can't do that with forward-looking carbon credits. You can get, right? You can, you can estimate it and the forward-looking climate math is its own animal, right? But so I think that's a big difference. So um, uh, that, that's my, my shorter answer to this. I don't know that there haven't been a lot of studies that, uh, um, I, I haven't personally seen a lot of studies that show exactly what you're saying in the water markets. I've seen, I've seen a lot of those in the carbon markets and you know, the carbon markets have their own, uh, their, their own dynamics. We think that we have, have put some mechanisms in place to help us um, get past some of those concerns. And that's, that's some of the things that we've built into this, uh, this concept. Great. Mark, uh, I think we're all gonna wish you a lot of luck in that. It was a very great presentation. Thank you for sharing with us today. Um, and I think we're gonna wrap up this session. Okay, very good, thank you. All right, thanks Mark. All right, judges, we are going to wrap up this session. We were going to have, uh, there was one company that couldn't make it today. So uh, so that's the end of that session. So uh, Blake, Tapasia, Z, Robert, thank you guys so much for joining. I, I think that was um, a lot of fun and good to see you all and hear your questions.